I think you are live, sir. Joe says we're live. And when Joe talks, I listen. I'm Bill so Young and sorry? You said when Joe talks, you listen, and I said so do I. There we go. Hey, well, God, come on. We're, we're, live. We're, we're, we're live now. It's now 16 years okay. after it opened. The studio at 620 is a magnet for all. I don't know what we're hearing. Poets, musicians, dancers, paint. I think okay. we're that go. Hey, Bob. Hello. Welcome to welcome to live internet TV. Mm -hmm. Hey, good evening. I'm Bill DeYoung from the St. Pete Catalyst. And thanks for joining us again for the Catalyst sessions. We're coming to you via recording a little later than we wanted to, but it's going to be a good one tonight. Joining us tonight is Bob Devin Jones, a Los Angeles native, arrived in St. Pete in 1996 when he was hired by American States to direct what was a unique production of August Strindberg's Miss Julie. On the West Coast, Bob had been an actor, director, and a playwright with a particular love and talent for performing the multilobic works of William Shakespeare, which is something he continued after settling in St. Petersburg. Now, it was 2004 when Bob and uh, David Ellis bought a rundown building at 621st Avenue South and turned it into a cultural community center. Now, in its 16th year, the studio at 620 is a magnet for all sorts of performers, from poets to musicians, dancers to painters. It was, and it is, an important part of the city's cultural renaissance. Bob Devin Jones, hi. Hello, Bill, how are you? I'm doing fine, I'm doing fine. Recovering from our earlier snafu, which nobody knows about, so we'll just, yeah. Hey, one time in your life, Bob, you wanted to be a history teacher. You said that somewhere. Um, what changed? You found I found theater. theater. Our theater found me, but I still have a love of history. I I have this maybe as a fifth sense or a sixth sense, but I can feel the vibration of the people who came before. So, like when I saw the pyramid, not the pyramids, but the Parthenon in Athens, you know, hands made that. Humans did that activity, and so I just have a connection about what trying to figure it out and what it is and why it is. So, you go first next time, guarantee you. You let me know if that doesn't happen. I'll make sure it doesn't happen. Next time, because that's how she goes. That's how she goes. You've done it a few times for sure. I have an idea. I actually use it as a trick. Who can be the first in the introduction? Because the person who's hey, Jeff. His shower. Hey, Bob, you still there? I say it. We're having all kinds of weird audio stuff going on. Um, well, you know, you, you feel the vibrations of the people. I mean, I, I had a weird feeling. I, I've been to Stonehenge a couple of times. I had a strange feeling. I don't know that I could articulate it in that way. How did that um, translate into the wanting to act, wanting to perform? Well, um, I'm a very gregarious, private person, and um, I like making things that didn't exist before, but not in the normal sort of narrative way. I've been doing this since I was a kid. And my dad also, when I was seven or eight, had us memorized as a contest between my and my sister of uh, the Gettysburg Address. That was the first thing that I memorized. And uh, so I rather liked it. I don't know if there's a, you know, a great lineage from wanting to be a history teacher to going into the performative arts, but, um, I, you know, the studio is also a performative place, but it's a place of heritage, of history, yes. of ancestral, all of that kinds of stuff. So we just like doing, uh, and I like doing, uh, you know, this sort of recreation of characters, uh, some in history, like in Shakespeare, but just, um, was something that I could do so and it took the onus off of me having to show up as Bob or as I used to be called Bobby. Bobby that works for me. I, let's talk a little bit about the, the work that you did after you decided to stay here. You said you met Jamie your partner at uh, Chataway which is a, a great story. So you decided to stay here, but you were working after for a number of years before the studio. Let talk to me about that. The kind of roles that you well, uh, I thought you excelled at and felt really good about. I felt really good about uh, 
well, this is before I came to Florida, but I played Othello at the uh, Berkeley Shakespeare Festival. I played um, Pericles at the Sacramento Theater Company. And um, I just have an affinity for William Shakespeare. Um, another thing that sort of saved me was uh, August Wilson. Uh -huh. I have very much an affinity for him. And um, I got uh, approved to direct a play of his in Memphis. And that started a long association with the uh, Playhouse on the Square in Memphis, Tennessee. I, and I think all of this um, acting and then assistant directing and then directing uh, prepared me to start writing. And James Baldwin is the biggest influence on my creative life. But uh, it was years later after I discovered him that I thought, oh, let me try my hand at writing, which I never thought I could do, and then found that I could do it. So I love acting and I love directing, but I particularly find very delicious the, the, the act of uh, writing. When did you write Uncle Ben's? And when did that come in? Uncle Ben's came about, um, ironically enough, I was working at the Sacramento Theater Company and I was thinking, after this play, I'm gonna give up acting, get a job at Macy's and work my way up the ranks and become a buyer. And I got a call from a friend Roberta Levito is a director, and she said my play had been accepted, this Uncle Ben's play, just a one-act thing, in the New Works Festival at the Mark Taper Forum. And it literally changed my life because this, uh, it's a phrase that Langston Hughes uses, Uncle Ben's is my shelter play. It has sheltered me and carried me a lot of places. Well, we should tell folks who are watching that you're going to be doing this virtually live Thursday. Yes. In will that will it be from your home? Or are you going down to the studio? From to my home. What time is that? Seven. That's on on your Facebook page. Uh, yeah, and on our web page. All the the oh, okay, the studio's page. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tell me, it's called the subtitle is "Home Cooked Negro Narrative." Tell me about it because I there's a photo online and there's a little bit of exposition, but I don't know what inspired the play so was. Two things. One, there's a fairly well-known photograph of an African American elder playing the accordion and tears boiling out of his mm -hmm. eyes as he watches the cortege of. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and something beyond just the optics of it just struck a chord in me. Yeah. And then also I got, I don't know how it was, introduced to the slave narratives that were taken by the WPA of the last living slave, people who had actually been slaves. Yeah. So I said, huh, remember? and I used to write a 20 minute, 30 minute play every Negro History Month because I always happened to be in Sacramento then, or they would fly me up. And I did Martin Luther King interviews, Malcolm X, uh, uh, Sojourner Truth, uh, Harriet Tubman writes letters to Frederick Douglass. Just, and the one year I came up with Uncle Ben's, a home cooked Negro narrative, I wrote it on a yellow pad. And then I just put in all these characters and I later flushed them out. Oops, my hands are getting in there. Later flushed them out when I did the workshop at the Mark Taper Forum. And then it premiered in its final phase, the one I'm doing now, at the Sacramento Theater Company in 1995. Or four. Now, Benz, is, Benz is a term, uh, uh, it means it has, I know that there's some kind of lineage there to, uh, you know, not breaking the rules, but bending not, them. Not only in bending under. the rules, but suffering whatever the epic of displacement has been for African American people or African people who then became Americans. And, you know, you can survive a couple of hundred years of slavery, but it takes some wit some grace, a lot of love, a lot of bending, but not breaking. Now there is all kinds of resistance, but 
uh, I also wanted to rescue some of those Negro Bilia characters like Uncle Ben's or the guy on the cream of wheat box or Aunt Jemima. Um, who are these people? What would their narratives be like? Not just the stereotype stock footage of them, but give them real passion, real hope, real dreams. The pain was already there. Uh, it's, in, it's in everybody's DNA. So I just took a flight of fancy and uh, I, having come back to the play now after about eight or nine years, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm surprised that I wrote it. <laughs> That's a good. That's a good thing. Um, your characters actually. Cook. I know you're a, you're a, a cook. A, your reputation precedes you, or a chef, as it were. You know, um, do your characters actually make food on stage? What, what you Wins, B and D S yeah. is the interlocutor, and he makes a meal of beans and rice, which I would serve to an audience if I had one there. Oh yeah, good but, point. <laughs> but, uh, um, uh, so, yes, I do prepare a meal of beans and rice. Of course, the beans have already started, but the rice is cooked in real time. Wow. And this is 7 o'clock Thursday. You definitely want to check. check. Yes. Fantastic. You have w what almost amounts to an open door policy at the studio. Famously, you know, you say yes to everything. Yes. Um, I've done a couple of events there. I had to, I had to pay you, but you were very reasonable, I should say. Um, but there's a lot of a whole diverse bunch of stuff going on there. Tell me why that kind of acceptance, Bob, is important to you. To let everybody do all kinds of stuff. Yes, because well, one, we live in a very fecund area. This St. Petersburg, Tampa Bay region, but particularly St. Petersburg, mm. it's got a very magic dirt that we're all standing on. That's why the First Nations people built their mounds here. The dirt is special. And the bench is quite deep here in St. Petersburg with regards to uh, uh, people having creative things that they want to do or think they want to do or might want to do. Like if you subscribe to any sort of thing, you might like everything they do or some seasons you might like three of the things they do or you might like one of the things they do. Yeah. Our philosophy and our mission at the studio is the answer is always yes, because that's an aff affirmation that we can do this. We're going to jar the floor and make something happen. Now, sometimes uh, we hit it out of the park and sometimes not so much. But we have, uh, like one artist, Jake Troyley, coming off of a basketball scholarship at college, undergraduate, calls me up. I want to do an art show. I'm going to be an artist and eventually go to USF. Uh, okay, come in and see me. And he now is on his way, if they have it this year, but he's been accepted into Art Basel. Wow. He's got a blue chip gallery in Chicago, I believe, representing him. And, um, and he's won accolades and Creative Pinellas has shown his work. But we not only were the first, but that's why yes is good. Like if I, well, if you like ice cream, you might like haagen -Dazs. And if someone said, Bill, would you like some ice cream? If it's haagen -Dazs. Yeah, yes, yes, <laughs> absolutely. Or Bill, would you like to go to Paris? Sure, I would, Bob, sure. yeah. Okay, so it takes all of the equivocalness of, well, we can do this, you know, that Kipling if. If this happens, then we can do this. And if this other things happen, then we can do that. And we have developed, and the community around us, I mean, you know it as well as most, it's very fertile. The ecology of creativity in this town, it's just exploded. Do you ever wonder why that is? I mean, is, is there a, you know, an organic reason for it? Or is it just well, I said, you know, pixie well, dust or the gift of the gods or whatever? Why is I think that? all of the above. I also think that there, every city is unique on the planet. And then at some times, a city grows through being special. And that's where we are here in St. Petersburg. This is our special time. It is. I, I, I've said 
this, I've thought this before. It really is a great time. Maybe you're not right now, but it's a great time to be living in St. Petersburg. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd rather be out and seeing everybody doing everything and hearing it in real time and live. And, you know, my next, the next question I wrote down, well, you know, was what do you think is the greatest thing about St. Petersburg? And I think you just answered it. Do, do you, do you perform enough? Are you, kind of done with performing because now you've got so much, you're a bigger role, you're an activist, you're in effect a cultural politician <laughs> for this area. Uh, well, you know, you're a producer. Do you sort of wish, yeah, I'd like to get back to acting or you had enough with that? I no, I've never had enough of it, but uh, Mimi Rice came up with this idea of radio theater. Yeah, yeah, of course. And I love that because I'm just so bifurcated in my attentions that it's difficult to concentrate on learning the lines. I came up through repertory theater where you did four plays uh -huh. in rep. You rehearsed one, opened him, then rehearsed the other, opened it, then rehearsed the third, opened it, and then rehearsed the fourth one to take uh -huh. on tour. I couldn't no more do that now than walk on <laughs> Venus without a hazard. So, um, yeah. Also, at this particular point in my life, um, it's so full only with uh, not only with um, being a part of a creative community but just going I'm sure you've written about them there's what's going to be and I'm sure I hope it's still happening a repertory old theater uh, next to uh, second on second and I said I can't wait to just the day it opens to purchase a ticket sit in the seat and watch what they've curated um, um, so I've been busy a good decade here, but, you know, perforce you start to slow down. And I am because I want to slow down to take in more of what this uh, amazing city has to offer. Like I said, yeah. every city is unique, but we're in our special place right now. It's, uh, it's interesting how. I, I think I understand something you're saying too, is you get almost a proprietary feeling like these are people make, making amazing things and I live here. Well, I feel, I didn't make the things, but I feel like a little bit of a part Absolutely. of it. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and there's just so much to do. And, you know, in fairness, it, it maybe was always a very unique city. I mean, we all ended up here. You know, California is similar in that, you know, you tilt the country and all the, you know, the magnificent storytellers clothed in magnificent tatters, yeah. you know, they all fall down into Southern California and now they somehow tip to the end of Florida here and there's a lot to do, there's a lot to see, there's a lot to be a part of. So I feel very well met uh -huh. in, uh, in Petersburg, even though I love LA the way New Yorkers love New York. I love Los Angeles, but uh, this is my home. I was born here and spent my first 21 years here, left for 30 or so, and I've been back for a few now. And it's, you know, it, the, it's still as beautiful as it ever was. There's a lot more people, um, but there's so much more. Yeah, it points cool, cool stuff. I mean, there's, there's so much creativity. It wasn't that way, really, in the old days. It was a great place. Yeah, I live in the old South. Uh -huh. I'm going to show you uh, what I look at every morning. Do you mind if I do that? No, no, no. Show me. <laughs> can you see? Show and tell. Can you see out the window? Oh, my goodness. There's water out there. I mean, it's, yeah. Oh, my, oh, my God. Yeah. So, I don't How know come you, you guys haven't had me over for dinner yet? I mean, look at this. Well, we oh can we sit on the porch, <laughs> yeah, but right. um, this is this is what I see every morning. Beautiful. That's beautiful. So, anyway, I'm coming back in. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you for showing me that. Yes. I'm going to go it, sit on my, my front porch and watch the sunset. Yes. Way off in the distance. You know? Well, we face... We see some magnificent sunrises. Oh, yeah. Beautiful. What's next for you after this? Other than being at home and wishing you could go out a little bit. 
Um, you can't even go to the Banyan Cafe. I miss that too. Yes. Yeah. Well, we're going to do when we can reopen again, whenever that is. Mm -hmm. We're going to one of Dave Ellis. Well, Dave Ellis's last show was called the World's Greatest Kite, the World's Greatest Kite Exhibition, and we're going to do a a, a, a reanimation of that, mm -hmm. and then uh, maybe Shakespeare in the Park again if we're allowed to do that. Yeah. There, there's no paucity of Delicious ideas. And have you ever interviewed Sheila Crowley, Cowley? Oh, many times. Yeah. Okay, of course. Well, brilliant. Well, Absolutely brilliant. Yeah. And, and as I've said on here before, the quietest human being I've ever heard. You can barely hear her speak. Oh, no, well, Matt is away with words. Matt is as quiet. But yeah, but he's taller. Yes. So, and <laughs> so I can hear him right at my ear level. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> he is an exemplar of why this is such a delicious place to live. She's always a font of creative ideas. Oh, yeah. I love her playwriting. I love that, uh, I don't think it was called, what was it called, Lady Pilots? Flying. Flying, thank you. Oh, sure, I was brilliant, yeah. Yeah, it was brilliant, yeah. brilliant, I love it. So, and I'm um, nourished by the fact that somebody down this, she lives around the corner, her and uh -huh. Matt, they're getting their work done. Paul Wilborn and Eugenie Bondurant live around the corner. I know um, your neighborhood. I know that view. I've wandered around there. Okay, lost. well, stop by. <laughs> Next time I will. We when can I can get out of here. <laughs> we on the porch. It was on the porch, exactly. And I, I want to thank you and Joe and all the people behind Catalyst because, we, you know, we know how things have changed in the journalism world yeah. and the catalyst has become a must see must do must hear must listen must devour um you're talking my language man yeah and i, I just but but i'm proud of it because it's like yeah of course we would have such, such a beautifully curated uh expression of the performance the intellectual arts well just of the community and you put your mirror on it very nicely. I, I, this is what I trained to do for years and years in other cities. And it was kind of a joy to be able to do it here in oh, my hometown oh. when I came back, you know. And uh, hey, uh, I thought maybe we could close out with a little Harold Melvin and the Blue Notes, huh? Oh, if you don't know me by now, yeah, you yeah. never ever know me. Yeah. Now, do you, know, you know, that's my song. I know. That's why I asked you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you want me to sing it? Yeah, I'll sing it with you. Okay. Let's do it. If, if you, you don't know me by now, you will never, never know me. And this is part of Ooh. Ooh. That's the important uh, part of that. Yeah, that, yeah the, it's got to be the ooze. I don't, you know, can you do the Teddy Pendergrass lead, though? No. <laughs> All the things we've been through, you should understand me. Yeah. We are understand you. you. Yeah. <laughs> Bob, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. And uh, we'll see it. We'll see you on the other side of this for sure. For sure, for sure. Thank you. Check out, yeah, check out Uncle Ben's, y'all. Uh, Thursday, seven o'clock on the Studio Six Twenty Facebook page. Tomorrow night on our show, a couple of opera singers are beautiful people, Sarah Norton and uh, and uh, Tyler Putnam from mm. St. Petersburg Opera Company and from Opera Tampa. They're a couple, they're beautiful and they sing better than, well, better than me, not as good as Bob, but. Oh, no, no, better. I'm not an opera singer. Yeah, shout out to St. Pete Opera. They, we've collaborated in, back in their early days. Collaboration is another thing that I think is just so wonderful around here. Exactly. Nothing's compartmentalized, everything yeah, overlaps. Yeah, no silos here. Yep. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go off and, uh, Fix some, fix some dinner. I was going to try and say something funny, but I couldn't think of anything. Okay. Thank Next you. Time. Thank you, my friend. We'll see you soon. All right. Bye-bye. Right. Unfortunately, Bye. I would have liked to have been a waiter. I only got to wait tables one time, um, kind of disastrously. But I worked, when I went to drama school at ACT in San Francisco, uh -huh. I worked at a place called Sal Magundi's, uh, behind a counter dishing up food. And, I, when I was living in London for a year on a year abroad program, yeah, teachers from the uh, Royal Academy of Dramatic Art, I got a job at the Action Space Drill Hall. So, I, you know, I've had a variety of things, but 
acting and directing and then writing, they all went um, hand in hand with um, a nice life outside of that, waiting for the next job, but still, you know, enjoying life. I've lived very modestly for most of my life. 